Hey guys, I'm Sun, I'm a privacy and a security researcher, and you're watching The Privacy Guides. This is the last episode of a mini series on passwords. I'll link to it in the description. The whole series is supported by Trust Token. I work on their security team, and they allowed me to share this with you. In today's episode, we are talking about threat modeling uh, briefly, and then I'm gonna be sharing seven things that I do to keep myself safe and private when using technology and the internet. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's, let's jump in. Um, threat modeling, not everyone is a whistleblower, so not everyone needs to have an incredible amount of infosec and opsec. Um, that said, a lot of people tend to use computers without realizing how inherently vulnerable computers are. Now, this for doing, you know, simple browsing and stuff like this is not such a big, big deal, although one's bank account or things like this could be compromised. Um, it's really in the context of people that have more sensitive use cases, so people working for companies that have access to privileged information, or people who have crypto, for instance. Uh, that said, again, there are a few things that one can do that really, really greatly improves our security and our privacy. But if one is a whistleblower and if one has a really sensitive use case, uh, unfortunately, whatever the password length, usually an attacker will revert back to using a $5 wrench attack, which essentially means hitting us on the head until we reveal the password, or using something called rubber hose cryptanalysis, uh, which essentially is as you've seen in James Bond movies when you put a pipe in someone's mouth and pour water or gasoline or all kinds of shit up their throat. And they're essentially, uh, what's the word for this in English? drowning uh, and they'll reveal secrets usually. Uh, so that said, uh, I always recommend compartmentalizing sensitive use cases away from the main computer if you've been following the series for some time. I've talked about how I use Raspberry Pi devices for this. I've talked about how I use Tails OS for that. I've talked about using YubiKeys or using Trezor hardware wallets or hardware wallets in general. I really like ColdCard as well. Um, so yeah. The idea is a computer that one uses for most things, our daily driver as they're called, that has an enormous amount of attack surface. So it's actually quite bad to use that computer thinking that one is truly private or secure. I don't think that's really possible. Hence why compartmentalization is one's first line of defense. That said, there are seven things that one can do that will greatly improve our privacy and security online. But before I go about and name those, if you like this content, please like it. It really helps with the algorithm. Uh, yeah, let's have a look. So number one recommendation is always generate truly random passwords. I recommend using passphrases. They're easier to remember. The thing is, if you try to make up your own password, usually it is bad. Humans are just really bad at generating truly random passwords. And humans are really bad at memorizing them as well. So as I mentioned throughout the series, I'm a huge fan of using a passphrase, a five word passphrase using the EFF short word list number two, I believe. Uh, that is actually very good. Uh, I'll link to it in the description. And there's a beautiful app designed by Mika Lee, another privacy and security researcher, who uh, it's called Passphrase Me. It's essentially a command line utility that one can install using pip. Um, I might create an episode on this. Let me know in the comments if you would like me to create that episode, but essentially you can generate them on the computer or you can use dice rolls as I showed, uh, I believe in the episode on entropy. Uh, the other thing is to always, always enable full disk uh, encryption. So essentially on Mac OS, that's when you enable file vault. Uh, on iOS, that's when you set a pin or passphrase. I always recommend on iOS, mobile devices in general to use passphrase. Uh, versus a pin, it's much more secure because it has higher entropy. Um, the other thing is to always enable multi-factor authentication. Now, strangely enough, a lot of people tend to really resist that one because it does add additional steps. It's kind of a pain, but it's massively secure. Uh, and to those who resist it, uh, an interesting thought I had the other day when riding my bike is that one always uses credit cards, right? And credit cards are inherently to a fake. You have the credit card, that physical thing, which you need to have, and then you have the pin, which is in one's mind. So those, those are two factors. So we've been using 2FA forever to secure our bank transactions, while the same applies when we connect to email providers, bank accounts, whatevers. We need 2FA because it makes it so much harder for an attacker to exploit. So in the context of 2FA, for most enterprise use cases, I would recommend using FIDO U2F or FIDO2. These technologies are very uh, resistant to phishing attacks, but you cannot back up 
easily anyways. Uh, well, actually you cannot back up. You can create two YubiKeys that you set up on all different websites that you go to uh, for FIDO2 or FIDO U2F, but it's kind of painful. So in the enterprise world, it's great because you have an IT department and if ever you lose your key, you can just tell your IT department like, hey, can you issue a new one? Uh, so I really like FIDO U2F and FIDO2 in the context of the enterprise. For personal use cases, I really love TOTP. That's what probably you guys are already using. Those are like the six digit little tokens that you have to enter within 30 or 60 seconds when you log in. Uh, in the context of TOTP, I have a few episodes on that. I always recommend having the password manager on the desktop and the TOTP app on mobile. And the reason for that is compartmentalization. So I recommend not having, that's kind of strange here, but not having the password manager on the phone and not having the TOTP app on the computer. And that creates an air gap between the two devices. It really increases security. And in the context of TOTP, uh, something that I really like is using a YubiKey, and I'll be creating episodes on that shortly. The YubiKey, uh, what's it, what is it called? I think it's called Yubico Authenticator. It's an app that you can install on the computer and on the phone. Uh, on the phone, it uses NFC, so near field communication, wireless for this to communicate with the phone. But essentially, it can be pass or pin passphrase or pin protected. So the uh, cryptographic material that generates those six digit tokens is actually stored within the secure element of the YubiKey, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the implementation of the secure element on YubiKey is proprietary and they don't share a lot of information, but I would suppose that uh, this information is secured uh, using the secure element on the YubiKey. So that is really a great way of doing TOTP and having it be portable between mobile and desktop. Next up, always use a password manager to generate truly random passwords for all accounts online. If you follow the whole password series, it is okay to use the same password or passphrase if it's if it has enough entropy, if it's complex enough for both your Mac and 1Password, for instance. And I explain in a lot of details why it's okay in the context of 1Password, even if you're using the web sync feature of 1Password, the credentials are never sent over the internet, uh, essentially, so that is great. One should always research this. If the credentials leaves the computer, they should be different than the computer's password. In the context of 1Password, it's okay to use 1Password. If you're using KeyPass XC, it's okay to use the same password because the password never leaves the computer and is secure by the full disk encryption. So you can have the same password for computer and 1Password, but then for all websites that you log on to, one needs to have a separate password for this. And given there's very little additional cost to us, we can just generate really ridiculously long ones because we're just copy pasting them in. Now, when we copy paste, we have to be mindful about clipboard exploits. I might create an episode on this in the future, but essentially it's best to not use clipboard, but it's, it's yeah, that's definitely a topic for a future episode. Um, okay, so uh, always compartmentalize sensitive data and computing away from the main computer. Our main computers are used for so many different use cases. They are, they have an immense attack surface because there could be one tiny exploit in one of the 50 apps that we're using and there's now a keylogger in the computer and it's possible for someone to exfiltrate data such as password databases and what we're typing, hence the password or passphrase. No matter how long it is, it's possible for that to be exfiltrated. So I always recommend compartmentalizing sensitive use cases. Two example of this is if in the context of PGP, uh, if you're signing an email or if you're logging into you know, uh, an SSH server, well, I use YubiKeys to store PGP key material on it and the computation when I'm logging in or signing or encrypting something is done on the key itself. So it's compartmentalizing that sensitive use case away from the computer. That means that someone, even if they have full you know, control on my computer, they cannot uh, impersonate me, or at least it requires massive social engineering, which is very uh, implausible, if that's a word in English. Uh, another great example in the context of Bitcoin is using a hardware wallet uh, in order to have one's seed material away from the computer. So then when we wanna sign a transaction, we can confirm it on the device itself that means that it makes it practically impossible for someone to compromise a transaction on the computer itself if we are mindful when confirming it on the hardware wallet. 
So those are two examples of compartmentalization. I've also mentioned using Tails to compartmentalize sensitive use cases away from Mac OS. And I also use Raspberry Pis that have been hardened uh, to create encrypted paper backups. Uh, you can find all of this using the search on my YouTube page. So youtube.com slash Sun Newton. Um, okay, next up, always lock the screen when one walks away from the computer. That's kind of an obvious one. Uh, on Mac OS, there is a feature when you click on the Apple that says lock screen. I always recommend locking it when you're not in front of the computer. And the other thing is when one goes through customs, one should always power off our Macs and our iPhones. I'm not talking about sleeping them. Why? Because full disk encryption in order to work stores the encryption key in the memory of the computer. Hence, uh, if someone has a really sophisticated exploit, one could exfiltrate that key and then decrypt the information. So if the computer is powered off, memory is volatile, meaning that that encryption key will be flushed from memory. So I recommend always powering off computers when one goes through customs. Uh, last but not least, scheduled backups. That is probably addressed to the enterprise people watching this. It has been proven scientifically that usually implementing uh, password rotations will yield weaker security. The reason is humans are inherently bad at creating passwords and memorizing complex passwords. So usually they'll just iterate on the same password that they've had before. Um, there's very little, and, and usually also they'll tend to have weaker passwords because they don't, they're just pissed by having to remember so many passwords and rotating them all the time. By the way, uh, that's all I have for you today. The whole reason for this password rabbit hole, password policy rabbit hole series is for us to rethink passwords and be a little more mindful about which things need separate passwords. Do passwords really have to be long? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of theoretical stuff that explains how passwords work and if they need to be that long. And hopefully I got some of this true throughout the series. Um, now, before I let you go, uh, I'm trying something new today and I wish I had announced this at the beginning of the episode. Uh, let's have a look at last episode and I'll try to answer a few uh, comments, a few questions that you have. If you have questions about today's episode, drop them in the comments and I'll try to do this. Let me know actually if you like this idea uh, and maybe that will become kind of routine here. Um, so yeah, uh, oh yeah, and first things first, as you saw, I was experimenting on some more clickbaity titles and thumbnails. That's after watching the episode by Veritasium. Um, it was very uncomfortable and I don't think yet that it's worth it for us because we have this relationship and we're kind of deeper down into the rabbit hole. I don't think my content is for everyone anyways, but um, yeah, let me know what you think about this whole experiment uh, thing and yeah, anyways. So, okay, looking at this here, um, why do you have a Trezor when you put so much value on secure elements? Great question. Uh, well, Trezor devices uh, are open source and even the schematics for them is open source. So there is this whole um, dichotomy behind, uh, between secure elements. So if we think about Ledger, yes, Ledger has a secure element, but it's proprietary and one does not really know how it works and if it's actually secure. And I think everyone would agree that everything ends up being compromised at some point or another. So I do like the transparency side of things of Trezor. That said, if you do have a Trezor device, always, 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 always use the passphrase feature. That's the uh, mnemonic extension, like the 25th word or the 13th word, because if you do have that, even if someone does compromise a Trezor device, because it's unfortunately possible, there is a theoretical exploit on them. Well, if they don't have that passphrase, they cannot do nothing with it. Um, okay, yeah, such a wonderful title. Thanks, again, let me know what you think about this uh, more clickbaity approach. I feel really shitty doing it, but maybe it works. Anyways, that's what all YouTubers end up doing. Uh, you can securely erase an SSD with parted magic. Um, yeah, actually, Jay, uh, is it possible to do this uh, in the context of, uh, what's the word? Why am I not having this word right now? Um, ah, anyways, I'll put it and it might come back. So SSDs and flash memory usually have a whole bunch of additional, you know, if it's like a 16 gig, it might have one, two, three, four additional gigs so that when parts of the uh, SSD goes bad, it uses those and it 
kind of does that through wear leveling and everything. So the reason why I believe it's really theoretically impossible to secure erase an SSD or a flash drive is that the logic layer that we address only, you know, it, like it doesn't reach us those regions that are not like active at a specific point in time. At least that's my understanding. That was that was really quirky here. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, does you're, you're mentioning here that it is possible. Does this account for wear leveling and the fact that a 16 gig SSD, it's not really 16 gig, there's actually more gigs available uh, and they're kind of used accordingly to how the uh, interface of that SSD drive works. That was, as you can see, I don't know everything about this. Um, is any of this affected running your Mac OS from an external drive? That is a great question. I would have to dig more deeply into this. Uh, my gut feeling, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I have to dig into this. It's a fabulous question. Maybe someone else knows. So essentially the question is, uh, when you have a T2 chip in a Mac, uh, does that T2 chip uh, secure using the UID, so the fused encryption key that's in the T2 chip, does that actually encrypt as well uh, an SSD that is external versus just the proprietary SSD that's part of the logic board? Um, very, yeah, very Apple read, no, no, yeah, TPMs. I have not researched anything in the context of Windows as I don't use Windows myself. I use Mac OS and Linux, so I cannot comment. Maybe others have uh, feedback on this. By the way, this is a very good question for uh, GitHub discussions. So if you go on my website uh, and you go to boop, 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 uh, here, and then you click on uh, docs, and then you click on the repo, which by the way, please start a repo. If you haven't yet, it's pretty cool because it you know adds some credibility to it. But if you go into discussions, here we have a whole bunch, well, actually TPM, interesting. We have a whole bunch of really great conversations. And by the way, thanks to everyone who has contributed to those. That's amazing. Um, okay, so looking at this here. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Anyways, I don't think this section should be too long because if people don't watch the whole episode, it hurts for discoverability. So yeah, that's a test. Let me know if you like this new idea of answering questions at the end and kind of giving feedback. I'll see you soon, bye.